And my name is Councilor Enrique Pepin. I represent District 5, and this is my first council hearing. So thank you for having me here. Uh, before I start, I just want to give a quick shout out to Jayla, who is shadowing her aunt today. She's on BPS winter break. So welcome, Jayla, to the council chamber. Um, again, for the record, my name is Enrique Pepin, District 5 City Councilor. I'm the chair of Boston City Council Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. I'm joined by my colleagues today, Councillor Aaron Murphy, Councillor Aaron Flynn, Councillor John Fitzgerald, Councillor Tanya Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Henry Santana, Councillor Liz Breeden, and Councillor President Ruti Luijen. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity channel 8, RCN channel 82, and Files channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.csit at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. If you wish to sign up for a public testimony here in the chamber, please sign in on the sheet near the door. If you are looking to testify virtually, please email Ron Cobb at ron.cobb at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing order is on docket number 0332. In order for a hearing to discuss the safety of our city workers, in particular, our code enforcement and Boston Transportation Department workers. Before I kick it off to the sponsor of this, I would just love to say that the safety of city employees is number one priority in this chamber. And it is important to realize that and to make sure that is a reality. And with that, I wanna pass it over to the sponsor of this bill, of this docket, Councilor Aaron Murphy. Thank you. And congratulations. I'm glad that Council Flynn and I are sponsoring your first hearing. This is exciting. Um, and thank you for all for being here. Um, our city, Bo city of Boston workers play an integral role in ensuring that our residents have access to the basic quality of life services they need, from maintaining our streets and public spaces to providing essential public safety services. Our workers are the backbone of our city. And I know we'll hear from a second panel, but you know that, and I appreciate all the work you do supporting your workers every day. After hearing of a horrible attack on one of our city employees who does work for code enforcement, it was, or sorry, for transportation, it was um, conversations that I had, and I know Council of Flynn had about that department, but I do just also want to uplift that since I filed this, a few of our municipal police have talked to me in the hallway and workers in other departments, library, BPS schools. So I don't want any city employee to think that we're not also supporting and advocating, but I do think the admin and the people we have in the room today are going to help address those two specific needs, which is obviously a need. So I just wanted to put that out there first. Um, Many work long hours are forced to take overtime shifts because of chronic staffing issues. These dedicated city workers are in dangerous situations at time. Last week, there were two assaults that I was aware of on code enforcement employees. An older gentleman who was only months away from retirement was so badly beaten that he was in the hospital recovering, needing surgery to the trauma inflicted to his face. I had gotten a call over the weekend from one of his colleagues who she herself was, um, I think, making the hard family decision that she was leaving her position because she also doesn't feel safe in her job working with the transportation department. Our office has heard from many city employees across different departments who have real concerns for their safety, and many are afraid to speak in fear of retribution, and I do think for us as counselors, we have to acknowledge that and um, be able to be a voice for all our city workers who may feel that they can't go to their um, you know, management all the time. 
So I just am um, thankful that we're here. It's why Councillor Flynn and I filed this hearing order last week. I'm happy that we could have the hearing as soon as we did. And I'll leave the rest of my comments for after we hear from the panels. But thank you, Councillor Pepin. Of course. Um, now I'd like to just pass it over to the vice chair of the committee, but also a co-sponsor, um, Councillor Ed Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Pepin, thank you for your important leadership in chairing this hearing today. And I know this is your first hearing as Chair of City Services, Innovation, Technology, and I'm proud to be your Vice Chair. And I know you're going to do an exceptional job as the Chair. I also want to thank Council Murphy for adding me as a co-sponsor to this important hearing as well, as the safety of our city workers those in code enforcement, in BTD, other city departments. This is a serious issue. As I mentioned, when this hearing was introduced, we have heard, and Councilor Murphy has also mentioned, we have heard from city workers, mostly from BTD enforcement personnel who have been assaulted on the job, seriously injured, because someone did not want to be ticketed. These, there are also in, incidents where city workers were subjected to verbal assaults. As we all know, this happens every single day. Many of the BTD workers, traffic enforcement professionals, are also women being harassed every day by, by men, particularly. We, re, we rely on our city workers to keep our city running. It's only right that we do all we can to ensure the safety of our city workers, code enforcement officers, others who work hard to serve our city and community. So I'm interested in hearing from our dedicated and professional city workers how we can support them. And if there's one thing I don't apologize for ever is, is standing up for city workers. And city workers all, always have an opportunity to speak here at this council chamber. And I know there was an issue where some union members were not allowed to speak or testify today, but I'm glad that was a mix up. I'll accept that, that it was a mix up and it's, it's been resolved. But when I invite city workers to this building, that should never be denied. I wanna hear from them. They're our, they're our neighbors. They're our youth sports coaches. They're involved in PTA. They're involved in civic organizations in our neighbors, neighborhoods, and they deserve to be heard. So again, I'm, gonna, I'm going to accept that just as an ordinary mix-up. And from now on, I expect when I invite people here that they do show up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. At this time, I would love to recognize our council president, Councilor Lu Ruti Luijan. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to central staff for all of your work. Uh, congratulations again, uh, uh, Councilor Papen, Chair Papen, on your first uh, hearing, and I know there's going to be a lot uh, more great hearings for you to come as chair of this committee. Um, I want to thank the members of the administration for being here. I want to thank all the work that you do, and I want to thank our city workers. We are a city that um, we need to be setting the example here as a city for all employers, whether it comes to our workers' safety, whether it comes to our workers' pay, uh, making sure that we are affirming the dignity of all of our workers. And when our workers are assaulted or don't feel safe in their workplace, that is not meeting the mark. Um, and I know that it's the city's desire to meet that mark, and it's the city's desire to make sure that everyone um, feels safe um, in their workplace. And I know that Mass Kosh does incredible work to put the pressure on the administration, but to ensure the safety of all of our workers in the city of Boston. Um, one assault is one assault too many, and so I look forward to hearing from the administration on the work we're going to continue to do to ensure the safety of our workers. And I've had the opportunity to work with so many of you um, on some of the issues that our neighbors face throughout the city of Boston. So um, 
I believe my staffers were out with you this morning um, in uh, Jamaica Plain or um, to, uh, really helping to address some of the rodent issues that we have in our city and the trash issues. So just want to thank everyone for your attention to not only this matter and this docket, but to addressing the issues of our residents um, around the city. Chief, uh, Dennis, John, I'm sorry, Nick. Nick, right, Nick. Um, I want to thank you for all the work that you do and also the workers. Um, we spend so much of our uh, days at work that it should be, it, f it should feel as safe as possible and it should be uh, another, another safe space for us. And so looking forward to hearing um, what the steps are to address the issues of safety. I know I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations, but uh, looking forward to the full conversations. I unfortunately uh, had meetings scheduled with the administration prior to this hearing, and so I'm gonna have to um, duck out, but my staff is listening and I'll be uh, following up as well. So thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Council Chair. President. Um, at this time, I would love to recognize City Councilor at Large, Henry Santana. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair, and congratulations on, on your first hearing. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm very honored to be here, um, really want to be, and then, you know, thank you to the administration for being here. Um, you know, looking forward to the conversation and seeing um, how we can best support you and in, in, in the safety of our um, city employees. Um, and, you know, as a new city councilor, this is something that um, I definitely want to stay informed and learn and build relationships with you all um, outside of today. So I'm um, looking forward to the conversation. Um, I, I also want to um, echo Council Ed Flynn. Um, you know, I, I definitely want to just be really um, intentional about making sure that the safety of our city employees are um, at, at the forefront of this conversation. Um, and um, also, I will also be stepping out um, in, in, in a while, but uh, my staff is also listening, um, and I'll do my due diligence and follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. At this time, I would love to recognize City Councillor Liz Braden. Chair, and, th and congratulations again on your first hearing. And thank you to the panel for being here this morning, uh, this afternoon. I see some familiar faces. Um, I think it's really disturbing to think that public servants, uh, your workers, are being assaulted and abused in the course of their work. Uh, and we know that enforcement of our rules and regulations in the city is vitally important to the quality of our life. And when we don't enforce those rules, uh, our, our constituents and residents are not so slow about calling us and giving us a, a hot ear about saying, why are you not enforcing and why is this happening? So, um, you know, you have the folks who get upset and then you get the other folks who get upset if we don't enforce. So uh, I really want to up uh, uplift the quality of the work that your people do. Uh, and how important it is to the quality of life in our city. Um, we all have to take responsibility for um, the rules and obeying the rules and just have, uh, as we share a, a big urban uh, area, this has to be a little bit of give and take. And I think we have to send a, a, a message to those who feel it's okay to abuse or assault our workers that it's not okay. And we also need to send a message to our workers that we are there for them and that we want to support them and make, have them be supported and feel safe as they go about doing the work of the city. So I, um, I have to maybe step out in a little while for another meeting, but I just want to thank you all for being here and uh, uh, just acknowledge that this is a really important issue and thank you to the sponsors for bringing this issue before us today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. At this time, I would love to recognize Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for giving a shot there at my name. That's really nice. Um, and it's, it's Tanya, not Tanya, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, to Chief uh, and members, of course, uh, for being here, for taking the time. I wanted to just get a real good um, idea, just a realistic idea of how long this conversation will take. Um, just because out of respect for our panelists, um, counselors being here, having that conversation is really important. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's, I think this was postponed at some point or I got it mixed up. But either way, 
um, I want to at least be here for the first round of questions um, and then do my very best to not repeat this pattern of coming in, telling you, uh, taking notes, or we're taking notes and leaving. So I, on my end, I too have a busy schedule, but would like to have a good idea of how long this will take. And this way, if it's like an hour, an hour and a half conversation, then um, just letting you know ahead of time that I'm here for an hour and a half. Thank you, Councillor. I think if we all have a respectful and fluid conversation, this would be a very, um, it should be a quick meeting. But thank you for being here. Thank you, and to add, um, thank you so much to the makers, to actually sponsoring this, super, super important. Um, our customer service to our constituents is important, and to piggyback off of what my colleague, uh, Council Braden, mentioned, yeah, they complain and that this is our job, and the mayor's job is constituent service, and we do our best to follow up, but respect is a two-way street, as we all know, so definitely um, hoping to have a conversation, understand really what the, what the issue is, where we can make sure to protect our workers, to support our um, employees here in the city of Boston, as well as figuring out um, you know the best way moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're looking great from that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize Councillor John Fisher. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations as well. Having just done my first committee, I know you'll be you'll be feel good after this that it's out of the way. So well done. Um, uh, thank you to the panelists for coming in today, Chief. Folks, uh, obviously, uh, you know we are just here in support uh, of our city workers. It's of paramount importance uh, to reiterate the chair. Um, we're here for the folks from BTD, from AFSME, uh, for for our city workers. Uh, that they can be safe and that they, they have strong union representation to make sure that those safety protocols are in place uh, and that, that we can follow through and provide them with what they need. So I look forward to hearing from you all and how we can help to strengthen that. Um, I also note that it's, uh, you know, there are jobs we need to fill in this city and we're having a hard time filling them. Uh, situations like this do not help us uh, attract and retain the city employees that we desperately need. Uh, so we have to take care of this to make sure uh, we can sort of put a plug in that, the, the hole in the bucket here of, of folks not wanting these city jobs, uh, because there are some good jobs out there that provide great services. Um, so thank you all for helping us to get there. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. This time, I'd like to recognize City Councilor Sharon Durkin. Thank you so much, um, Councilor Pepin. Um, excited uh, to see your leadership in this committee and congratulations on your first hearing. I uh, want to thank um, John, Dennis, Nick, and Yasha for being here. Um, the safety of our city workers could not be more important, but I'd like to also add um, a, a lens that I've really taken is mental health. Um, so the idea that folks um, who are in these jobs see someone in these jobs um, who, um, who has experienced such trauma. I just want to center that and, um, and just provide a little bit of um, commentary on um, while we have these incidents of, of horrible, horrific things, we also have smaller incidences where our city workers are being disrespected and treated in a way that um, that isn't appropriate, and I've seen it, um, you know, in my work as a district counselor um, in in my first six months. So I just want to thank you for everything that you guys do to deliver for city residents. It's incredibly important. I want to thank um, Jim Durkin and um, uh, Tiger uh, Stockbridge for being here from AFSCME Council 93. Thank you for your service and all the work that you do. Um, and I want to thank the makers of this for having this conversation. Um, though I don't think it can fit within one hearing, creating a safe environment for our workers. Um, but I know the folks that are here, um, you know, from John to Yasha are doing everything they possibly can uh, to ensure safety for our workers. So thank you for being here. Um, and, you know, I guess in terms of the questions that I'll be asking, um, I won't be asking questions about one incident, um, but really how we can make um, how we can make it safer for every single city employee. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, at this time, I would like to give the opportunity to the panel to quickly introduce yourselves, starting with our Chief, Yasha Franklin-Hodge. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Yasha Franklin-Hodge, Chief of Streets. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I'm joined up here by uh, several of my colleagues, uh, Deputy Chief of Streets for Transportation and BTD Commissioner Nick Gove, 
uh, our superintendent of waste reduction, uh, Dennis Roach, uh, and John Blackmore, who uh, oversees the code enforcement uh, unit for the city. Um, so grateful to them for being here. Um, and I just want to start by thanking the council uh, for this hearing. Um, this issue is incredibly important, and I am very grateful that uh, you uh, acted rapidly to call a hearing to bring attention. Um, unfortunately, this particular hearing was prompted by a terrible violent assault perpetrated against one of our parking enf enforcement personnel on February 2nd. Um, and I just, I think, it goes without saying, but no public employee should have to face violence in the course of doing their job. That is unacceptable and it is infuriating when it happens. Um, this is an extreme example of the kinds of uh, behavior that many of our enforcement personnel encounter, but it is by no means an exceptional example, unfortunately. Uh, it, just in the last few years, we have had multiple members of our various enforcement teams who have been assaulted, they have been hit, they have been pushed, uh, they have been threatened in some cases with firearms. Um, this is, you know, on top of what is a daily litany of verbal abuse that these employees endure um, at the hands of members of the public. Uh, this kind of behavior is despicable and it is unacceptable. And, you know, I think we, we've t we, we heard several of the counselors talked a little bit about this. You know, nobody likes getting a ticket, right? We understand that. And, uh, but for, you know, when we think about the services that are being provided, the reasons why we are issuing these tickets, as Councillor Braden said, this is about ensuring quality of life for our residents. The code enforcement ticket that gets given to the person who didn't shovel their sidewalk is to make sure that someone's older parent can safely walk to the grocery store from their house. The, you know, par the, the parking ticket that gets given to somebody who parked at the edge of the block past the no parking sign, that is to make sure a fire truck can get down that street if there is an emergency. These are not things that we do to create impositions on people. And I think far too many folks have adopted a sense of entitlement that they can park where they want or they can do what they want and that it's somehow the city is in the wrong for catching them in the act. These are the consequences of their actions, these tickets. And it is absolutely unacceptable to take out the consequences or to, to react to the consequences with, with violence or intimidation or threats against city employees. Um, that having been said, you know, we understanding that this is unfortunately a, a reality right now, we do a lot to try to keep our employees safe and you'll hear from Deputy Chief Gove a bit about some of the things that we do in terms of how we structure our uh, operations and the equipment we provide. Um, but we know that there are always opportunities to do more. And so we are looking forward to this dialogue with the council. We know that this is gonna take partnership with uh, you know, amongst uh, the administration, our staff, with ASME, the union that represents most of the uh, enforcement employees in our cabinet, uh, with BPD, uh, with the district attorney's office. All of these folks will have a role to play in helping ensure employee safety. And so we are uh, looking forward to constructive conversation about what is working today and what we can do more of uh, in the future. Um, but before I turn it over to Nick, uh, I just want to close by saying thank you first uh, to the people of the, the officers in the Boston Police Department who responded uh, in the wake of this assault. Uh, they were on scene rapidly, they acted quickly and with great diligence and they were able to apprehend um, you know, within hours the uh, suspect in this assault. Um, and bring serious felony charges um, with the help of the district attorney's office against that individual. So grateful uh, to the Boston Police Department for that and also to Boston EMS who arrived on scene very quickly to treat our employee who had severe facial injuries and transport him to Boston Medical Center where he was able to receive excellent care and has subsequently, uh, after undergoing surgery, been discharged. Um, Lastly, I just want to say thank you to the people who do this work, some of whom are in the room here. Um, this work matters. We have your back. And 
I just want to express my gratitude for the folks who do this important service every day because it is hard. It is a hard job. It is a job where people face things they should not have to face, but it is essential work. Uh, and so thank you to all of the people who do it. And with that, I will hand it over to Deputy Chief Gove to talk uh, a bit more. Thanks, Chief. So again, my name is Nick Gove, Deputy Chief for Transportation, also serving as BTD Commissioner. Just to reiterate the Chief's comments, this, this most recent assault on one of the BTD employees um, was just a cowardly and just deplorable act of violence that, um, against a public employee that we, we as a community should not tolerate. So, um, That said, in, in regards to the incident on February 2nd, I want to reiterate thanks to uh, Boston EMS, Boston PD, they were quick and thorough that evening. I also want to thank uh, Boston Medical Center staff for the incredible care that they provided to our team member, uh, as, many, as, as well as many other people that day. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the professionalism and compassion demonstrated um, by the rest of the BTD enforcement team uh, who supported their colleague during this really difficult time. They, I think they deserve some, some credit here. Um, for background, for those who may not be familiar, uh, the BTD enforcement units enforce the City of Boston traffic rules and regulations citywide. Uh, parking, the parking enforcement unit is currently at about 125 people, and they're assigned to sh uh, six shifts a week. The tow and hold division runs the booting and towing program, and they also support construction acti activities as well as safety, uh, public safety and special events. Both units have standard operating procedures that govern unit activities, which include safety protocols and incident management tools for emergencies. Obviously, for security reasons, we can't discuss all of those protocols in detail here today, but we can share some examples and certainly take questions. Uh, so, for example, parking meter supervisors are assigned to work in teams of at least two. Um, with supervisors who are assigned to uh, supervise those uh, smaller teams on a shift. Um, parking meter supervisors are also all, all assigned radios um, so that they have a communication tool between each other, their supervisors, as well as dispatch. Those radios are equipped with an emergency call button that they can utilize in the event of an emergency. Um, Parking meter uh, supervisor vehicles are also equipped with GPS, which can be an important tool locating someone uh, during an incident. Uh, following the incident on February 2nd, we completed an after action review of our standard operating procedures. We have already or plan to implement improvements to these SOPs and we look forward to working with the City Council, Boston Police Department, and re representatives of AFSCME Council 93 on ways to better protect our employees and deter future acts of violence. With that, I'll hand it over to Dennis. Great. Uh, my name is Dennis Roach. I'm the Superintendent of Waste Reduction for the City of Austin. Um, my role is, uh, active role is overseeing both Waste Reduction and the Code Enforcement Unit, over in John's unit over here. Um, I, have a, I have a pretty unique perspective as a div division head um, on these, these types of roles. I started 21 years ago as a parking enforcement officer in BTD. Um, so I, I went through those ranks and certainly experienced a lot of what's being discussed here today and what's happened to some of these employees and it's a real thing. I mean, it's, it's real in the streets. These people um, deal with customers every single day. They engage in very, very difficult situations to um, handle. Um, they do an excellent job at that role, but unfortunately a lot of times um, it goes the wrong direction and you know, we're here today because of one of those instances. Um, it's something that we take and I certainly take serious every single day. I talk to John, I talk to my other division in waste reduction who also goes out there, inspects and deal with constituents. That safety is a f the, the first priority every single day when we, we go out in those streets. So we, we do everything we can to make things safe. I think John will go into some of our protocols in code enforcement division. We, we do many of the same things that Nick does in terms of um, having radios on all of our people, having GPS on our, on our cars, and doing everything we can to make, make everything safe. We are certainly open to this discussion about how we can make things safer because our employees are out there every single day experiencing this. We have contractors out there in our streets working on behalf of the city that are experiencing these situations as well. So anything we can do to kind of support and make everybody, our city employees safer, um, our ears are open. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis. 
John Blackmore, Director of Code Enforcement. First of all, thank you for holding the hearing. Uh, no city employee should be assaulted verbally or physically. I've been in code enforcement for 30 years. I've been on that end of it. We've all been assault, you know, assaulted or verbally attacked. It's part of the job, unfortunately, but it shouldn't happen. Just like Nick, code enforcement does all the same things. We have the GPS, we have the radios. Uh, all, my, all the code enforcement officers are in vehicles for all their shifts, and our overnight shift is pretty much strictly assigned to the densely lit downtown area at night because they are in the overnight doing a lot of the commercial trash stuff. So that's the area that they're assigned to. Um, again, it shouldn't happen. And I'm open to any suggestions, here to listen, anything I can help. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for being here. Um, at this time, I would love to just start the, the Q&A portion of this meeting. Um, I'll allow Councilor Aaron Murphy as a sponsor to ask the first question. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Dennis and John. Um, you weren't originally on our list to um, come and speak as panelists, but I appreciate that you're here because I know, but you shared with everyone now that you have that unique lens working your way up through so you know firsthand you were there doing these jobs. Um, and I'm not surprised, but I am happy to hear that each of you did echo that attacks on our city workers are not acceptable and that it undermines the trust not only of our residents, but also business workers, business owners, small business owners in the neighborhoods, tourists who come. I mean, it's something that we don't want to have happen in our city. Um, but to get to some of the specific questions, and I'm thinking, and the other role we do have on the council is, you know, the budget hearing. And oftentimes I always ask, like, if you had a wish list, like, what would it be? Because oftentimes you come already with your, you know, your budget and everything you've planned for. But if there was a wish list, especially those of you who are out there with them on the streets and you know, what supports would you add? What would you wish that your employees, and I know that there is a national shortage, like are there always two people together or because of staffing shortages, are there oftentimes people have to work alone? Like, so questions around that, like what would you hope that your employees had that would make not only them feel safer but actually be safer? And the other question and also something that is just a fact is we need your code. We need people to give tickets. It's a huge revenue to the city of Boston. What is the total amount each year that we bring in to the city of Boston's revenue through tickets, through both code enforcement and transportation, if you know that amount? So obviously we can't have them take school vacation week off or not work nights. Like they, we have to have people out there giving tickets. So we're laying people off and closing libraries on Saturdays and basic city services, not just the services they provide, keeping, like you said, tickets to people not shoveling their street, but the revenue that comes in from these tickets is a real necessary part of our overall budget to keep all of our departments afloat. Sure, I, I, can, I can start with the second question first, and, and obviously I won't go into a, a whole kind of analysis, but. I think as a snapshot, you know, this particular incident, or the recent incident, um, was on the overnight shift. Um, and obviously one of the more challenging shifts to, to staff. But to, to the point that the council raises in, in fiscal year 23, the overnight shift issued 108,112 violations totaling almost $7.8 million in revenue. So. A lot of that goes to supporting the overnight street sweeping operations that occur throughout the city. So it is not only, um, you know, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, an important rev source of revenue, but it's also providing a critical uh, basic city service that without our role, um, public works would be really challenged in, in completing that work. Um, in regards to, you know, kind of staffing in general, um, we have seen some improvement in fiscal year 24. We've hired uh, 20 parking meter supervisors this fiscal year. Uh, we have a hiring day coming up in March. 
Uh, so we have made some pretty significant strides from where we were a year ago uh, on, on overall staffing levels. And I know we're kind of focusing on that one horrible incident, but it is true that this was brought forward. And like I said in my opening statements, we want all city employees, not just, but was that incident, was he alone? Was he not with somebody else? Um, the, he is a supervisor on, on the overnight shift, so he is, he is supervising uh, the others who are in Pierce. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to my colleague's question. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question would be for the transportation team. What is the typical day in terms of hours for a traffic enforcement officer? Are they also subjected to mandatory overtime? Sure. Um, I can answer that. Yeah. So um, the parking meter supervisor assigned to six shifts over the course of a week, basically Sunday evening uh, through Saturday. Um, while Overtime is is frequent uh, because of current staffing levels. Um, you know we are not we are not making overtime for those shifts mandatory at this at this time. No mandatory overtime. No. Okay. When traffic enforcement officers are out in the neighborhoods, are they by themselves? Are they working in pairs? What is the setup for them? to be close to a fellow employee? So they're, they're working, uh, so the shifts are broken into smaller units, so uh, a supervisor is generally supervising a smaller team uh, who is assigned to a particular geographic area within the city. Um, when they're deployed, they are, they are working in pairs, uh, and the supervisors are um, you know, supervising those, those groups. Oftentimes, you know, it's a combination of depending upon where they're doing the enforcement, uh, they will sometimes be uh, assigned into smaller passenger vehicles, but oftentimes on, on some of the lo longer corridors, um, for example, in places where there's, you know, long linear sections of parking meters, you know, they'll, they'll go to a site or a geographic area in a van uh, and then be on foot. Thank you. And I also want to acknowledge the long-time service of both John and Dennis as well. Um, John, give us a little bit of background on some of the code enforcement officers. Are they working as, as, as a pair with a supervisor in the area? How do they go out and, and conduct their official business? No, so, so the code enforcement officers, they're all in vehicles, like I stated. We have 12, 12 code enforcement officers and three supervisors for the whole city. So obviously, as Code enforcement does have a staffing issue. We definitely need more staff. Um, supervisors are relatively close to them because the supervisors are going to check on them. You know, supervisors are broken up into three different areas, you know, because they are on three different shifts. So the supervisors are routinely going around and checking on each officer to make sure everything's, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing to also to make sure they're safe. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. I also want to highlight the important role that AFSCME 93 plays in this issue, working closely with our union officials as well is important. So I want to acknowledge Jim and Tiger for their, their professionalism as well. Um, I guess my final point would be, and I, I want to let my other colleagues finish, there's also a public education component to this. I mean, I think all four of you are trying your best and doing your best and under difficult circumstances. Um, but it's also up to the public to understand the tough job many of our city workers face every day and the harassment many of them face every day. Many of the workers, as I mentioned, are women and women of color, and they're doing the best they can. And about the last thing they need to do is get harassed by a, a, a man for giving, giving that person a ticket because the person is 10 minutes late for um, going by to get their meter updated. 
Um, so it's a real embarrassment to the city to have a, any assault on a, on, a, on a city worker because they play a critical role in our city. And I also want to hear after the next round, what are we doing to educate the public about being a better neighbor, being a better citizen, don't be, a, don't be rude, don't be aggressive with our city workers. Understand that they have challenges also. And to take your challenges out and frustrations out on them because you got a $50 ticket, well, you know, that's, that's where we come in, where we can educate people or try to educate people about how important city workers are. They're invaluable. As I mentioned, they're our neighbors. They deserve respect, they've earned respect, and it's up to us to educate the public to stop being a bully and stop intimida intimidating city workers. They're not making much money, they're working hard, they're trying to support their family, and we have some, someone probably from outside of the city, the North Shore or the South Shore, or wherever they're coming from, to give a city worker a hard time. That's, that's unacceptable. Um, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll listen to my colleagues as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Council President, Rosie Luisa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to Admin for being here. One of the things I wonder is, is there either formally or informally a mechanism for employees to talk or to give ideas about how to make either the building safer or their work on the job? Like, what does that look like? To, is, is there a formal channel? Is there an informal channel, like thinking solutions oriented? Should we have a formal channel um, where employees can suggest ideas on how to make the workplace safer for them? Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to let uh, some of my other colleagues speak to this. I mean, I will say we are, um, we receive feedback from staff through both formal and informal means, right? Certainly everyone who is in a supervisory or managerial capacity has a responsibility as part of their job to speak with their team, to listen to their team, to understand if there's a problem, to escalate that problem if it's not something that they're able to address. Um, and so that is certainly my expectation for everyone who's in a, a management or supervisory capacity is that they will be a conduit for the needs and concerns of their employees and will be part of helping develop solutions to that. Um, you know, we also receive feedback through less formal means. You know, I get emails from uh, people on the team as uh, does Deputy Chief and the Superintendent uh, as well. Uh, and we try to make sure that we treat those with uh, a great deal of seriousness and consider what's being said and where necessary, um, you know, bring folks together to try to address an issue. Um, beyond that, you know, I, I'll let Nick and Dennis speak if they have other thoughts on the way in which we handle this kind of feedback from employees. Thanks, Chief. So in, in addition to um, the examples that uh, Chief just mentioned, you know, we have, we have periodic labor management meetings um, with, with AFSCME as well as the other, other unions. In this particular incident um, happened on the overnight shift and, and some of the standard operating procedures for that shift is different from um, some of the other shifts in, in BTD. And so uh, this incident happened on what would be their last shift of the week, which was Thursday night into Friday morning. Um, we met with the team on the start of their week, which is on Sunday night, um, to meet with them and talk about some of the ways that, you know, we can work to improve uh, some of the safety protocols around their shift in particular. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that we have already implemented and, and plan to work with the union um, to implement some additional measures. But those are, those are some examples of the kind of, you know, engagement opportunities we try to create with, with staff. Um, in, in my unit, both in waste reduction and code enforcement, um, we're quite smaller than Nick's division, so it's, it's much easier. We, we've started to implement um, all staff meetings in both divisions. Um, it's been a little bit more challenging code enforcement because we're sp spread across so many shifts at different times to get everybody in the same room at one. I think we have one scheduled for this Monday. But we, we've been having these open forums to discuss everything, issues of operations, safety, all of that in an open forum session. But we, we have a much smaller group and it's much more doable in, in, my, in my division, I would think. 
Thank, thank you. I, I, I want to just suggest that sometimes maybe employees, whether through Ask Me Local Council 93 or other mechanisms, when safety or security measures are put forward um, and they're not supported or not advanced or rejected for whatever reason, that those reasons are made clear and it's not because we're not honoring your safety or we're not honoring your security, it's because there's another reason that makes this untenable. And so let's find an alternative. I often think that, you know, hopefully this is happening, but um, the ability to sit across the table and realize that we are all working for the city and trying to make sure that we're safe in our jobs, I think that's gonna be really important. And, and when you make answers and responses clear as to why you can't go forward on, with doing something, it sort of takes out sort of any guessing as to why you're not supporting it. It's like, because I can guess, okay, if I, if I propose something and you don't support it, you don't care about my safety. Or your management and you don't, you don't care about the lived experience of everyday workers, even though you were once there, you're not there now, and now you're management, and so we're just going to assume it's that you're sick of hearing from us, or you don't care about us, or there's something else. And I think it's really important that we propose alternatives uh, to make people feel seen, heard, and valued. It's so much of this, and what we do every day is about affirming people's dignity. People show up and they spend, again, more time with their coworkers than they do with their families. And in order for us to make that something valuable, we need to make sure that we're affirming people's dignity, both in their feeling safety and in their paychecks, right? That's another way that we affirm people. And so switching over to the paychecks question, I know at its height we had about 185 traffic code enforcement workers, and right now we're probably hovering around 103. The delta, what accounts for that delta? What accounts for that attrition over what period of time? And I think Councilor Fitzgerald mentioned this, we have a lot of job openings, so like what, what are the job opening numbers, so like hard numbers, and if you don't have that information now, because we are coming upon budget season, I do request via the chair that you, uh, that you give us that information. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be happy to provide any specific details. I mean, I will say when uh, this administration came in, it had been, um, you know, this is sort of post-pandemic, post the height of the pandemic, and there had not been a class of parking enforcement officers, parking enforcement personnel that had been successfully hired in, I think, three years. And so through, you know, normal attrition, through the stresses of the pandemic that led to a lot of employee burnout and, you know, across the workforce, uh, we were seeing historically low uh, enforcement numbers, I think, at its at its lowest point, we dipped below uh, 90 people on the enforcement workforce. Um, that was compounded by the fact that there were not only vacancies for frontline staff, but also at multiple layers of management and leadership, which meant that we didn't have the personnel we needed to hire and train incoming uh, groups of folks. And so mm -hmm. part of our challenge as a management team has been to rebuild the organization at every level. Um, as Deputy Chief Gove alluded to, we've made some really substantial progress. We've hired two new classes of parking enforcement personnel. We have a hiring day coming up. We're expecting to hire another class in the coming months. So I think we have turned the corner, um, both at the management level and at the staff level, but it's going to take us some time to rebuild. The good news for parking enforcement is that because it is a revenue generating activity, um, it is, you know, we are generally not budgetarily constrained in terms of our ability to hire. So we are trying to use hiring days, use more promotion of the roles to really make sure that we're bringing people in as fast as we can absorb them. Um, and Nick, is there anything you would like to add to that? Sure. I mean, certainly for budget season, we can come with some more kind of specific numbers. But, but right now, just parking meter supervisors, the entry level position mm -hmm. in enforcement is hovering right around 100 and there's approximately another 20 to 25 supervisors mm -hmm. within that team. Uh, so we, we do still have a ways to go to get back up to the historic levels that, that you mentioned. Thank you. I, I don't have um, any further questions, but I, I will say that I think making sure that classes are, are, are that we're following through um, is, is something that's going to be really important. Um, also, I, you know, I think that with budget season coming up and us thinking about how do we further support that, we also need to think about like this is also us losing revenue, right? Because the more offices we have, the more revenue, and we're talking about how do we increase the city's revenue, 
So it's also, there's an economic interest here for us to sort of take the burden off of our workers by making sure that we have enough workers. So we could, all, I always like to, if I can't win you on the humanitarian, on the moral argument, on the, let me break this down to dollars. There's an economic reason for us to, to um, make sure we're fully staffed. And, and I'll just say this, that um, you know, we always have hearings that are admin, and then we have uh, our community panel or our advocate panel. And uh, again, going back to like wanting people to sit around the table and talk to you, I hope there's a, an opportunity to just listen and somehow be responsive to sort of issues that um, people and our workers uh, bring up. So I just want to say thank you for your time, and I know that this is something you care about. I think it's just about showing it more intentionally probably to our workers, which would be helpful. So thank you. Thank you, Council thank President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Councilor Santana. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you to our panelists again for being here. Um, I'll keep, um, I think you already kind of touched a little bit on, on, on some of the questions that I have. Um, <clears throat> and, you, and you mentioned kind of like, you know, all having different protocols um, when incidents like the one we're talking about happen. Um, just in general, can you kind of walk us through kind of step by step of those protocols? Um, and then, um, I know Councillor Flynn mentioned kind of there's an educational piece here to our residents, right? How we're treating our city's um, um, workers, um, and you know we can definitely all take um, more responsibility in, 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 in that educational piece. Are there any things that you know you all as a department do kind of to prevent um, you know some of these incidents and kind of I guess that, that that will go kind of more into the training that's provided um, to to our workers. Like, how are they trained to? Um, you know, in code, in code enforcement to, to deal with a resident that's upset about it. Like, what, what kind of goes into that? Um, thank you. Those are my questions. Appreciate it. So, at code enforcement, we try to just de-escalate it, talk them down. Um, if the constituents are happy about receiving the violation, they call, the officer will call the supervisor. Supervisor will respond to the scene. Um, if the supervisor is not available, they'll reach out if they put a 311 complaint in that they're unhappy about it. One of our supervisors will call back and explain why this violation was issued okay. and how to remedy, you know, fix the fix the issue. Okay. So we just try to talk, just de-escalate it. De I mean, it's it, also I'd, I'd like to add is is we do stress um, to not over engage with the constituent to, to feel the need to walk away or feel the need to pick up if it becomes if the situation escalates really quickly. 311, I mean, three, I mean, 911 is an option to call 911. We try to tell them not to engage. It's not worth your time. Um, and then we get the supervisor involved. And if it, if it gets to another point, it's, it's immediately called 911. Um, and Boston Police has been super responsive in, in some of those cases. Thank you. The only thing I would add, you know, I don't think at this point. Uh, the only thing I'd add, I, I don't think at this point we have a sort of structured program of public education, I and mean, it's something that I think all of us in, you know, visible leadership roles in the community have some responsibility for, including, you know, those folks on the council, and I appreciate the folks who are giving voice to the, you know, the, to this issue and the importance of, of people behaving with respect uh, towards public employees, and that's something I would ask everyone to continue to reiterate um, as you uh, speak to folks in the community. Um, I think, you know, we, it's certainly something we'd be open to looking at if, if there are a effective uh, approach to this kind of public education that's been used uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of is important to always remind people of, right, these are not, you know, it, it's sometimes in the moment people get hot, right, and they, and they get upset and they yell and they scream and sometimes do other things, but like, you know, all of these, these, these are not, you know, these, these should not be life or death moments in people's lives, right? These are, you know, it's a parking ticket. And all of our uh, tickets that we issue have a uh, very fair, very structured appeals process. We make it very easy for folks to appeal tickets of code enforcement or parking tickets. And so, you know, that's part of the, the job that we have is just to, to remind people, to put it in context, right? You know, if you're not happy with it, if you think it was unfair, there's a much better way to get resolution than screaming at somebody on the street, right? And, you know, quite frankly, if you've ever appealed the ticket, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're, 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 we're often very forgiving uh, in circumstances where, you know, there's any doubt uh, at all about the ticket. So I think that's, that's the option we like to try to make sure people know about. 
To, just to add, I mean, you know, uh, de-escalation is absolutely one of the kind of primary tools in, in the toolkit, but I, I will say I am, I am always impressed by, um, you know, I, I have watched our folks um, engage people based on the way that they are engaged. So if, you know, if you approach someone in a respectful manner with a question, um, you know, nine times out of ten, you're going to get a respectful and educated response. Um, so I, I, I think that I think the team does an incredible job of that, of, of kind of managing that. Um, unfortunately, when when somebody approaches you in a really uh, aggressive uh, situation, it's it's difficult and probably not in their best interest to do that. But I think particularly um, many of the supervisors who've been around for a long time gain that experience over time. Uh, and I, you know, I think they're they're some of our, our best customer service advocates out there. Yeah. Well, thank you for those responses. I, I look forward to being able to be um, uh, an advocate and support for for all of our city workers. And again, thank you to our panelists for being here. Um, thank you to our makers for for putting this hearing together. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, John, I think I heard you say um, specifically, like, just transparently, you know, that not only people have been um, assaulted, but um, to what uh, chief, the chief was mentioning too, also hospitalization following. And as I was listening to you, I could almost feel, you know, a sense of like unfairness in terms of how your employees or, um, and I'm not sure if you personally have felt it, um, and, I'm, and I'm truly sorry, to be able to have a job and you're just trying to provide for your family and you get, go out there, um, just, it's a regular day. You're just doing your job. And some, for someone to have the audacity to lay their hands on a person just for doing their job is absolutely um, despicable and uh, just disgusting. And I'm just very sorry that if you are on, on my behalf, if you or your your um, employees um, personally have experienced that, um, I, I wanted to sort of sum up what I've heard from my colleagues um, because it, it I, I want to understand exactly where we are in this conversation and how we can um, practically look at solutions. Council Murphy talked about you know a wish list. If that if, if there was a wish list, and obviously. I am always an advocate for, um, for the working class in understanding that as a city, we do not pay people enough um, to do their job. And, and I know that the administration has been trying to slowly work with um, ASME or unions or figure it out, um, but we're not, we're not even close to where we're supposed to be when it comes to paying our employees or at least our lower paid employees. Um, and so, during budget, you know, maintenance budgets, we look at what worked, what didn't work, um, and so really wanted to hear a response of where we are with that for our lower paid employees, especially the people on the ground. Are there, and I'm sorry if I'm not up to date, are there any negotiations at play for um, pay raises? Yeah, I mean, so, so I think, um, thank you for bringing up the issue of pay because I do think, you know, I certainly, believe that we do not pay uh, our public employees in some cases as much as, as they deserve to be able to do the jobs that they do. And um, that's especially true for those employees who make the least amount of money within our cabinet. Um, <clears throat> there is a, uh, the, the city has negotiated a uh, new collective bargaining agreement uh, with AFSCME 93 that contains uh, some pay increases including uh, was for some increases that are uh, fixed in amount and some increases that are percentage in amount. And uh, the inclusion of fixed increases has a sort of disproportionate benefit to people at the lowest end of the wage scale. Um, and so we see that as something positive for uh, those folks who are making the least within the city. 
Um, ultimately, you know, decisions about salary are uh, a kind of complicated dance of uh, bargaining and budgeting, and um, so, and you know, I, 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 at some level, sort of outside the direct control of uh, you know individual leadership members of the leadership team, such as myself, but we do our part in those conversations and in those negotiations to advocate for what we see as the places where our workforce is most in need and um, you know, through the process of bargaining, um, you know, hopefully results in a contract that uh, delivers better wage fairness for our employees. Thank you. Um, during our budget process last year, some of our council colleagues, um, which I chose not to disclose names, decided that mo moving monies around because there were specific um, amounts in the operating budget that would, re would hire new hires. And so in, if it was in the operating, my argument was, could we put it in contract so that we could actually attain the services quicker? Or could we raise people's salaries so that capacity wasn't as such an issue to attain? And um, so where are we with, with that? I, I, I remember, uh, I'm not going to discuss numbers. This is not a budget hearing. Um, but uh, where are we with hiring? And does this new negotiation help you to increase capacity across the board? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the full question. I mean, I will say from a hiring perspective, you know, we continue to have challenges across the board in the streets cabinet. We have an extraordinary number of vacancies, um, you know, in, uh, at least unprecedented in modern uh, in recent history. Um, and so this remains a challenge. Salaries are certainly a component of that. And, um, you know, we're working to try to understand whether there are other elements of the employee experience or the way in which um, you know we recruit that are uh, impacting our ability to find the people that we need. You know, we are operating in a historically uh, hot labor market, um, which is good in aggregate, but very challenging, um, you know, for us in our, our leadership roles. I mean, ultimately, we don't. You know, as I said earlier, right, as a, as a cabinet member, right, I don't have the ability to dictate salaries or wages, right, that has to go through both the budgeting and the bargaining process. And so, um, you know, I think the, the, the contract negotiations are really the place where these questions of, you know, what, what positions at what, uh, you know, uh, pay scales will be, you know, how, how pay scales will be established for each of the different grades of positions that we have. Um, and certainly, you know, the city has to pay for, be able to pay for whatever we uh, offer and settle on at the table. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, a, that's part of the process and why our finance team is involved, obviously, in bargaining to make sure that we are uh, settling on contracts that are uh, fair to the workforce but uh, affordable for the city as well. I don't know if that answers your question. It does answer my question, although you started with, you wasn't clear on okay. it. <laughs> and so, so wasn't certain thank you so. for clarity that we put a lot of money in operating to hire. Mm -hmm. And so it meant that we had some money to give people raises. Mm. And so why not just raise the people that are here, make it more attractive to hire new people? Mm -hmm. Because how could you hire you know, so many millions of dollars within one fiscal year or should we have to move money to our capital so that we can render those services that we need it if we can hire fast enough? That was just, yeah. okay. that, that was just okay. where I was coming from. Got it. Got it. Not, okay. not another question yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. on that. Um, in terms of what Council Lujan mentioned in, uh, about feedback, and it was mentioned in the order that there are some concerns about, you know, um, retaliation, if people give feedback and stuff like that. You mentioned that they were both, um, they could do it anonymously, but they could, there was also different ways through supervision or the ways that people could give feedback. Um, and in thinking about what Councilor Flynn mentioned in terms of educating the public and working with the public, is there any type of um, campaign or educational anything that you, uh, in collaboration with ASME, um, had in planning in order to uh, bring this to the public and say, look, this is, we're like, we're human beings, this is what's happening, this needs to stop in educating folks. I mean, folks know not to be jerks, but they do it anyway. So how do we get through the public? Is there anything in planning on creating this sort of, I don't know, outreach? 
Yeah. So that, that second question, at this, at this point, no, there's not a formal outreach campaign that's in planning, but it's certainly something we'd be open to, to doing and working in collaboration with um, the labor union as well. I think, uh, you know, I, ha I have long believed that we would have a much better society if everyone had a mandatory year or two of public service in local government and people had a little bit of that empathy of understanding. I wish I had that before I, I started. It is, it is, it is life-changing, right, to do at any level to come in and do this work and to understand the challenges that people face and how hard people work on behalf of their city. And it pains me how few people understand and appreciate that. And so I think we would be very uh, open and excited, frankly, to find ways to help more people understand that and hopefully see that humanity, feel that empathy, and uh, show and have more respect for the important work that maintains the quality of life in the city. Um, I just wanted to address the, the point about people feeling like they can't speak about something that they this are. This was a point in the order, not my point, but yes. Yeah, I mean, I think for, from my perspective, right, it's very concerning for me personally to hear that there are people who feel that they can't speak about a safety concern for fear of retaliation. That should never be the case. And I will just say, as the you know chief of the streets cabinet, right, my door is open, my inbox is open for people who want to talk about a concern. We have formal channels and we encourage people to use them, but if they are not working or if somebody feels that they are uh, cannot use those for some reason, I, it is certainly the expectation of the administration that people have the ability to use their voice, especially on matters of safety. And so, um, you know, it's, it's I, without knowing details, it's hard to respond to any specific circumstance, but uh, it's something we, I would like to work to address um, where, that, where that concern exists. Mr. Chair, my final question. Um, thank you so much for that. Super important. Um, I know that you and I have had some conversations where I would come in just with a, but of the thousand questions a rookie know nothing about nothing, and um, but I, I learned fast. And um, you had to say, "Hey, you know, start with start with the positive things that that helps um, the good stuff that we're doing." And I appreciate you all for the work that you do for our city. Um, I wanted to get so basically hearing. You know, we talk money, we talk uh, feedback, we talk mechanisms. Um, we talked a little bit about education to the public. What specifically, or if there are any, um, if you're using technology tools, if you are uh, strategizing, if there are specific systems in place uh, by which folks are uh, talking about, if something happens, if a safety thing happens, these are the steps from A to you know, Z, what you should uh, do or follow in, if, if something should happen. Um, and in different phases, right? Um, and then, obviously, how can we help you? This is, this is a conversation, it's, we're all saying the right thing, but what's the solution? What do you think is the solution? What, how can we help you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, as uh, Nick and Dennis and John have spoken about, right, we do have standard operating procedures that are part of our training that include um, support for how to deal with safety issues that occur while somebody is working. And so those vary a bit by, um, you know, different teams and their own particular work circumstances. But ultimately part of our goal is to make sure that we are providing training for people that includes clarity on how they can both keep themselves safe and what to do if something happens, who to contact, how to approach the situation, when to call 911, when to radio a supervisor. You know, we are working with those procedures to make sure that we have people who are there to respond, that if, you know, there's an incident where, um, you know, we're not able to reach somebody that we can locate them, right? These are all part of our standard operating procedures. So these guys can give a more sort of detailed lens into exactly how those work in any particular circumstance. But I think the big picture is that um, that is a critical part of our job in management is to help working with the workforce establish procedures that make sense and that are functional and effective. Um, you know, at this point, I mean, I, I appreciate, um, you know, your, your comments about learning, right? We are all learning. And so I think for 
uh, you know, for us, it's it's you know, if there are things that you are hearing that you know you uh, that have are concerning to you of like something that isn't working, we want to know about that, right? And that can come through the council, that can come directly from employees, that can come from uh, the union representation for employees. Um, these are all things that we can take in and, and work in where we have procedures that need to change or training that needs to be updated. Um, that's our job to do that, and we will. Thank you. Any feedback about? how this hearing could be done differently or something to add or something, how can we help you? I, th I think the only thing I would add is, is we, you know, we talk about our code enforcement officers, even our BTD officers, is most of those um, women and men are very, very professional people that really know how to do their job and de-escalate situations. They do the great job. It's the people on the other end that, that bring them the aggressive situation. And, when, and I th we're seeing more and, more and more instances where those numbers are rising and they're dealing with more of it, more and more of it. So I, I, you know, I think we're all saying it, but like, you know, we, we obviously can provide more training to our staff, but what, who we have out there, they do a wonderful job. And it's not their fault that they're engaging in these situations. So I just, just want to add that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I'll just add, I think, I think the pu public education component that's been mentioned a few times here is important. I hope, I hope today is the start of that. Um, you know, just to speak a little bit about the training that, you know, the, the BTD enforcement team goes through. I mean, they, when they're hired, they start out um, in, in a very kind of formal classroom setting where they are, where um, training is administered um, by, by senior parking meter supervisors from within the department. Uh, our structure is such that you can only work your way up to the supervisory positions uh, having started at the entry level. Uh, so it starts in a very uh, kind of formal classroom environment. And then when it does move into uh, the field, um, we're not just putting them out on, on their own. They are, they are shadowing, um, you know, uh, more experienced and seasoned um, supervisors who have that experience. And sometimes some people pick it up quicker than others and sometimes people need, need more time. But, you know, we don't, we don't assign people um, to shifts until um, we feel that they are at a point where they're prepared to, Good. to do that. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Fitzgerald. Thank you, Chair. Um, quick question. In terms of the, the injured employee, has anyone gone to visit him yet? Or do we know if anyone has? Yes. Great. Yeah, I just I, want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I can't, you know, for respect for him and his family, but uh, yes, yes. No. Uh, and I think, I think several uh, members of the PTD team have uh, visited him throughout, certainly when he was in the hospital, and then also, um, you know, since that time. Great. No, nope, it's great to hear. I just want to make sure that, yeah. right, I know if it happened to one of my staff and I didn't show up, I don't think they'd be inclined to really come back and help me prepare for a hearing the next day, <laughs> right? So uh, I just want to make sure he's, he's getting the love. Um, have you guys thought of, have you, I know lately I've gone to different city departments, spent a day in the shoes to understand the work that's getting done. I've been a school teacher, but gone out with the outreach team, done a number of other things uh, to really understand the hurdles that these folks face. Have we gone out in a more informal way, talked to your staff about what they think the safety suggestion should be? Because obviously, right, you gotta go right to the people that deal with it every day to understand. And if so, what are the, any of those suggestions that have come back that we might be able to help support? Yeah, I mean, we, we have over the last year um, hosted kind of a number of um, kind of informal uh, meeting sessions with kind of leadership within within the streets cabinet. Uh, and, and those, those meetings have uh, solicited uh, some, some really good feedback on a variety of, of, of issues. I think, you know, we can, we can certainly look uh, to create more, more ways for people to be able to offer um, that kind of feedback and input in a way that is maybe more approachable. No, I understand. It would just be, I, I've learned that it, just myself going out there, the feedback I've got and the lessons I've learned through a lot of the city parts has been invaluable in that way and helping me understand it. Um, not to say that you guys don't do or understand it, but I would just suggest maybe making a concerted effort of even informal, just showing up at a site unannounced and saying, hey guys, what do you think? What's going on, uh, guys and girls? What, like, what do you think 
you know, Paul, Susan, what do you think you guys would need for safety? Um, it could go a long way. Um, you say that when an incident occurs, they call a supervisor, right? Uh, and the supervisor is then to show up. Is the supervisor tasked with any uh, authority or any sort of um, uh, power or capability to do anything? I know, um, you know we've stripped Rule 400 away from most of our employees in the past, um, but it seems with the rising amount of incidents, uh, and, and I know this is delving off into some other stuff about our munis and other things like that, uh, but is there some sort of training or authority that they should have to be able to deal with an escalated situation? Uh, knowing that your team does a great job as is, as you say, they are the de-escalators, the folks that are out there on the front lines, first and foremost, and they do a great job. Um, but if the fallback is just to call a supervisor that comes, uh, but doesn't have any real authority over the situation either, uh, it, you know, I feel like that's how we could end up in another situation like this. Um, just to know if, the folks themselves should have some protection given, a training around a protection, so in case they are alone or not in twos or things like that, or if the supervisor, if they are the first line of defense, and I know if it escalates quickly, call 911, and I appreciate that. Um, but if there is some sort of authority we should be giving to folks that are sort of the first line of defense in that backup call. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, yeah, to your point, um, you know, our, there was a time when some BTD employees wore specials. That, that is no longer... Um, no, the supervisors, the senior parking meter supervisor ones and twos do not have any um, authority beyond their ability to write um, uh, regulation, uh, write violations consistent with the traffic rules and regulations, i.e. they are not law enforcement and do not yeah. have that capacity. Um, and on the jobs piece, uh, I, I, someone, I think I heard correctly, there were two classes recently that were coming through. Do we know how many, how many have gotten through in that class? Uh, and what was the, how many applied for the class? And at the end result, what was the uh, amount that came through that we were able to hire? We've, we've sworn in and retained just about 20 officers uh, in fiscal 24. Um, as we've mentioned, we have a hiring day coming up in March. Actually, I, I'm going to be hosting that hiring day here uh, at the pavilion, um, and we're you know we're hoping that the last couple classes have been around 10, 10 to 12 folks. Uh, we're hoping for at least that, preferably um, more. So, um, you know, in in an ideal scenario, we would get um, two more classes in before the end of the fiscal year. Um, I. I should note that, you know, we're also, um, for the first time in several years, uh, doing the um, exams for the senior level supervisor positions within the department um, and, and the interview process that follows with that. So we're kind of backfilling that, um, you know, that level of, of, of supervisory experience as well. So, um, yeah, that's we, and again, I think when we come back um, at budget time, we can provide uh, kind of some some really hard data as far as where we're at as far as position shifts, etc uh, But we we do feel like we are making progress. I, I will just I will just add to that like um, I am very optimistic based on what we are seeing in terms of the interest uh, We are seeing people apply to these jobs and that is very very encouraging right there is people see these as attractive jobs understanding all of the challenges that they may face in them um, and so we are seeing qualified folks applying. Uh, as the Deputy Chief mentioned, right, part of our onboarding and training process is really assessing readiness. And we do find with most classes of parking enforcement folks that there is some percentage of people who come in thinking this is the job they want. And uh, either they or we realize that it is not the job for them. And so, you know, it's uh, important to realize that early and not put somebody on the street who isn't the, able to do the job well and ready to do the job well. So, you know, it is a bit of a process. We are also working against the usual kinds of attrition, retirements, and, and other uh, changes in employment that uh, mean that we do, in addition to adding folks, we are also losing some folks. But we are now seeing the overall employee count trend in the positive direction, and we have a very strong pipeline of hiring for people and process for uh, training and onboarding new classes of folks. And we're just going to keep at it until we get our numbers where we need them to be. No, I appreciate that. Uh, a final recommendation if folks, obviously, uh, about the employee that was injured, it's always nice to hear from 
from the head of the, the department. And so if you folks have not gone yourself, I still think that goes a long way mm -hmm. to visiting the individual. It's nice to hear from, um, it's always nice to hear from the top, right, to know that they've got you back from the top down. Um, thanks, guys. Um, that being said, uh, thank you very much. Thank you guys for all the work you do. Uh, Chair, I see my time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Pippen. Um, and to build on something that um, Councillor Fitzgerald said, um, I would really love to go uh, visit Frontage Road and um, get to know more about sort of on the ground what folks are dealing with. So I don't know if that's something that the department would be open to, um, having city councilors you know, go, but I would really love to do that. And I know um, some of our colleagues have already done that, but I haven't had a chance to do that. <laughs> haven't had, I know Councilor Pepin and <laughs> Councilor Fitzgerald have done a lot, but I would love to uh, come myself and, and see more about um, the work there. Um, and also, uh, I would love to do a ride along uh, with you, John, <laughs> and just sort of see what, uh, what we're dealing with at the street level. Uh, because I think it's partly for me, um, I have like absolutely no arrogance about knowing what you guys are dealing with at the street level when I haven't experienced it myself. Um, but I can tell you from six months of being a city councilor, I know that people, there's a lot of de-escalation that's needed in a lot of the conversations that we're having, um, in addition to um, folks needing to be supported um, it, when, they're in, um, when they're in situations. Wanted to talk a little more about um, the supervisor versus the um, versus those that are uh, on the ground. Can can a supervisor go out alone without a pair of two? No, that so and and I should I should probably explain the kind of structure here. So the entry level position within uh, enforcement, I think, had a different name at one time, but it is now. Uh, referred to as a parking meter supervisor. And so the next level up from that is a, a senior parking meter supervisor one, and then the most senior level is a senior uh, parking meter supervisor two. So, uh, so it can be confusing when we use the term supervisor interchangeably, but uh, no, we, 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 we try to minimize um, the opportunities for when people are alone. Um, the, the senior supervisors themselves Yes, there, there, are, there are times where they are alone because they are moving uh, from one area to another in, in, in many cases. Um, but yeah, we, we do try to schedule shifts and, and deploy people in a way that really uh, tries to avoid the opportunity that they are by, completely by themselves. Thank you. And in terms of the sort of tickets that are written um, overnight, and I guess this applies to both, um, but the, the tickets that are written overnight, um, is there a specific focus on making sure that people aren't out alone at night? Yes. And um, do we have a general understanding of the sort of percentage of tickets that are written overnight versus during the day? Like, is it more important to, to be able to ticket during the night? Because those are when a lot of the, you know, just curious of sort of, how much, how, you know, how needed enforcement is at night versus during the day? Sure, no, it's a great question. So obviously there, you know, the violation type overnight is significantly kind of different than during the day. For example, meters are not in effect on the overnight shift, right? Um, the, the largest uh, violation that we write overnight that I referenced earlier is for street cleaning. So, you know, we wrote, uh, almost almost three point four million dollars worth of uh, street cleaning tickets associated with that overnight so um, and again that's important because without that support it would be it would be difficult for public works to uh, com complete that effort so um, you know we can <clears throat> we're happy to provide a kind of a complete analysis um, to the council if they'd like to see it as far as the breakdown of violations that occur when and, and uh, on the various shifts. Well, I think to be a good district counselor, you just have to be constantly curious. So I would love to see that. But <laughs> yeah, we, we can get that to you. The other thing I would highlight in the overnight is resident parking enforcement. And mm -hmm. certainly in your district, Councillor Flynn's district and many others, that is a crucial, crucial. Yep, uh, Councillor uh, Anderson's district, that's a crucial issue. Um, and so, you know, making sure that 
you know, we are enforcing reliably so that somebody who's coming home from a late shift, um, you know, overnight has a chance of finding a space in their neighborhood. That's, that's a critical quality of life uh, service. And I have to say, I feel like this panel of people is some of the most important to my district to have relationships with. So I'm just really honored by the care and the time that you all take to answer our questions and um, when I know that this is a highly sought after panel of people during um, a work day because there's a lot that's being done in our districts. Um, so just wanted to talk a little more about um, sort of like what campaigns could be possible around this in particular. And I just, um, my chief of staff came up with this, but kind of creating a little bit of a different um, sort of like, a, you know, we do a lot of campaigns with the city around different things. And I think um, when you're talking to a police officer, you know that they have the ability to write you a ticket or not. And I think um, oftentimes when people see someone writing a parking ticket or a code enforcement ticket, they sort of think that there's that same decision-making quality of on the street. Um, so I'm curious if it would be helpful for us to have something like, almost like on, on them that says like, I, you know, I write the ticket, I don't decide the rules, appeal your ticket here. Something like that where it's very clear, um, you know, I'd, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention like, Tiger is wearing the stuff right now. So just imagine that that sort of something, there was something on you that said, right? like. I don't, I write the ticket, but I'm not making the rules. Like, here's where, here's where you can go to figure out what the rules are. Um, I know it's a simple thing, but like, people oftentimes, like, that could be one of the first point of de escalation is your problem isn't with me, it's with the rules. Um, and I don't know how we do that. I mean, that could be via social media, that could be a video that we put out um, with the chief in it talking about, you know, how, how things work and how these tickets are decided, but I think there's some education that um, we aren't letting people on the street to make a judgment call of whether to ticket for something or not. So let's let people know that they're not the ones making that decision. Um, and I'll just add that people are dealing with so much in their lives, and I think it's very easy to take out their frustrations on people that they feel are just adding to that burden. Um, so we really need, um, you know, I have a constituent who reached out to me. It's taking her six months to, to get a therapy session in the city of Boston. We have a shortage of people who have access to therapy, um, that, or a shortage of people who have access to the resources they need. Um, so this is a symptom of a way bigger problem. And, um, you know, I'm, this incident, I'm so, uh, I was so uh, emotional reading what happened to someone who works for our city, uh, but I know even the smaller things really impact people's quality of life and their mental health. So I just want to thank you all for um, dealing with, um, you know, and trying to make the world a better place for the folks that are underneath you. But we have a lot more work to do as a society to ensure people have access to what they need access to. And this is really just a symptom of a way broader problem. Um, that being said, um, I, I think it's so helpful to know that there's a focus on people being in twos at all times, because I wouldn't feel safe um, approaching someone's car, approaching someone's property, and walking our streets at night with that specific purpose. It can be very um, scary to, um, and I know that from, you know, door knocking at night and doing all the things that we do on campaigns at night. Um, you can't do, you can't be on the streets with that kind of, with a purpose of doing something in the middle of the night. So I just want to thank everyone for being here. I know this is a very sought after panel and your phones are probably blowing up and I know I'm hoping to <laughs> talk with um, Dennis after this about some issues that we're dealing with in my district. So I'm really grateful for all of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I do have a question for the panel myself, but before that, I just want to also reiterate just thank you to the, to the workers that are here. I see you in the back. Um, Angel, I see you. Um, Chris, I see you. Um, just a few weeks ago, almost a month ago now, I was out in Mattapan Square with one of your code enforcement officers, and 
the job you guys do is unnoticeable, but it's so impactful to the city of Boston. Um, and I remember that the residents said, I didn't know you guys existed, but you guys do such important work. So I just want to reiterate Councillor Fitzgerald and Councillor Durkin's point about education, about letting them, letting the residents know that this, those departments exist. It's important work. Um, but now to my question, and it is regarding the person that, the, 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 the victim, because um, I think we haven't even, we haven't asked this question. What's next for him? What is his protection? How is he being taken care of by the city um, when he comes back, if he wants to come back? Um, how is he going to be taken care of? Yeah, I mean, I, um, when I just I want to be respectful of the confidentiality around his his situation, um, but you know he is a he is a long uh, time member of the department over thirty years of service. Um, he is out of the hospital uh, and and kind of on his way to hopefully healing. Um, he is obviously uh, still dealing with uh, the implications of his injuries, so he is he is not back to work yet, and and frankly. The discussions around that haven't even started yet. So, uh, but I can tell you, we are in regular communication with him about um, if and when he needs anything, and you know, uh, the decisions around um, you know his his return to work or what he does next uh, will be a conversation that we will uh, work very closely with him on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I know that we usually do second rounds of questions, um, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, especially people that, I mean, we all, the work, those city workers, and I know that a few folks have signed up to testify, um, and they, I, I think we should give them some time to do that. Um, so with that, do, do any of my colleagues have any immediate questions for this specific panel? Okay, thank you. Um, Um, to the panelists at the, um, that have been here today, thank you so much for your time. Um, I would love to just make sure we give the, the those that are here to testify to give the time. I, I ask you if you please stay here or you know, go as you please, but thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and they go to the mic. Or do they come to the panel? Um, if the panelists, if you guys can stay, thank you. Um, so the way we're going to do this is um, we're going to I'm going to call you up one by one because um, you're test you're public testifier. So I'm going to call up Jim Durkin from Ask Me first to come speak at that podium to the left. Yes, sir. Well, to your right, my left. Is the mic on? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Chairman Pepin, members of the council, uh, and good afternoon. I'm Jim Durkin. I'm the Legislative and Political Action Director for Ask Me Council 93. And we represent more than 21 hardworking women and men here in the city of Boston, including approximately 125 parking enforcement officers who have the very difficult and thankless job of enforcing parking regulations in our city. And I, I want to begin by thanking Councilors Murphy and Flynn for uh, making this hearing happen and for attempting to work with us to provide a safer working environment for these officers and, and all city employees. Uh, as we all know, one of our parking enforcement officers was brutally beaten earlier this month simply for doing this very difficult job. And this assault has garnered a lot of media and public attention over the past few weeks, and I suppose that's a good thing in the long run, but it's important for all of you, for the Wu administration, and the citizens of Boston, and the tens of thousands of people who drive in and out of our city every day to know that this was not an isolated incident. In fact, if you talk to virtually any of these workers, you'll learn that it's a regular part of the job. We've got uh, two of our members 
here to speak with you today, Sergeant Christopher Starkbridge, a code enforcement officer in the city and president of AFSCME Council 93, and Angel Brayer, a parking enforcement supervisor. Uh, many more would love to be here, but they're on the job. However, we are able to share uh, information we obtained from the workers who can't be here today thanks to a brief email survey we conducted over the past few days with our parking enforcement offices that we did in preparation for this hearing. Uh, suffice to say the results were disturbing but uh, unfortunately not surprising uh, at all to us. Uh, you're all in politics so you know the typical response rate for these type of surveys when you send them out it's about 10 percent at best. Uh, Incredibly, our response rate was 70%, which alone is, is a strong statement. And of the 73 workers who responded, just two, two indicated that they had never been physically or verbally assaulted on the job. Uh, just under half of the respondents reported experiencing verbal assault on the job. Even more disturbing, 46% reported experiencing both verbal and physical assaults, but it's the frequency of these occurrences that is truly shocking and sad. 59% reported being verbally assaulted while doing their jobs more than 30 times over the course of their career. 46% reported being physically assaulted between one and five times. 5% reported being physically assaulted over 15 times over the course of their career. Now, not all these physical assaults rose to the level of what our member endured uh, earlier this month, but there's still assaults and there's still a crime. But for those who might be inclined to downplay the effect of less serious physical assaults and verbal assaults have on their victims, they need to ask themselves how they would feel if just once in the course of doing their jobs, they were pushed, kicked, spit on, or endured a tirade of filthy insults. How would, some, how would they feel if someone came up behind them and dumped a quart of milk on their heads, which happened to one of our offices a few years back? a 62-year-old woman, by the way. How would they feel if someone inexplicably directed a filthy insult towards their mother or their wife? Or for the more serious assaults, how would they feel if it was a family member who was the victim? A son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a brother or sister, a parent or even a grandparent? How would they feel if someone fired a bullet at them without even knowing their name or anything about them other than the uniform they were wearing or the job they were doing for the taxpayers. Some of you may recall that event. It happened about 10 years ago. A bullet was filed through the windshield of a parking enforcement van, and I can still personally remember having that worker describe to me the sound of the bullet as it passed just inches by his head. But look, we could go on and on about this all day, and our members certainly could too, but we already know this is a problem. And today's not just about talking about the problem, it's about finding solutions. So before I turn things over to my colleagues, we want to offer a few quick ones. As we said in the media in recent interviews, the biggest problem is the public's attitude towards these workers. For some reason, there's a lot of people out there who view these workers as the enemy, despite the fact that they keep the public safe by preventing parkers from blocking fire hydrants, crosswalks, or even parking in a handicapped spot. They also ensure that the limited amount of street parking in the city needs to be rotated on a regular basis by enforcing time limits on meters. And ironically, if they didn't, most people would never even be able to be in the position of getting a ticket in the first place because they'd never find an open spot. So how do we change that attitude? Uh, one of the suggestions that came in from more than a few of our members, and we were happy to hear it from, from some members of the council, was a citywide public relations campaign educating the public on the important work they do and urging them to treat these workers with the respect that they deserve. Now, that'd probably help, but it's not gonna sway everyone. So going forward, when these attacks happen, we need to find a way to get tougher with the people who think they can treat these workers as an outlet for their anger. Assault and battery on a public employee is already a separate crime on the books here in Massachusetts. It's section 13D of uh, chapter 265. Carries a jail term of 90 days to two and a half years in a house of correction and a fine of between $500 and $5,000. We suggest that going forward, every time this happens, that the city council and the mayor 
right to the district attorney and urge prosecution to the fullest extent of this existing law. And we also ask that the administration have a presence in the courtroom for all related proceedings. It doesn't have to always be a, a lawyer or someone from the law department. Any representative would do. The point is when this happens, would like to see the administration treat the victims as they should, as a member of the family that needs and deserves support. And we believe this would send an important symbolic message of support both to the victim and the prosecutor and the judge. Now section 13 D of 265 covers assault and battery. We also invite the council and the administration to work with the Boston delegation, state house delegation, to amend that law to impose a heavy fine for simple assault. Our hopes to change the public's attitude towards these workers, but we're realists. We know this has been going on for decades and we know it's not gonna change overnight. So we believe a heavy fine for any type of assault would be a big help in making people pause and think before they act. And in addition to pursuing a change in state law, we also ask that you explore the possibility of a city ordinance that may accomplish the same goal. Now, we're not sure that that's even possible, but we believe it's worth exploring, perhaps through the state legislature's home rule petition process. Finally, we ask that you also look at what the MBTA has done to publicize existing laws around assaults on public employees, which includes signage, noting the law. Uh, anything that can be done to expand the consequences and educate the public on the existing consequences would be a step in the right direction, in our opinion. Uh, I, I'm going to stop here. I, I, I do want to add one thing that was not part of my prepared remarks, but I, I feel compelled to respond. Um, and and I, I mean this in the most respectful way, but we, I've heard, we've all heard more than a few times here talk about how much revenue that these workers generate and how it's important to the budget. And it's true. They bring in a lot of money. But I would caution you to be careful how you word and you talk about that. Because I think when you do, it kind of plays into the misconception of the public that this is all about bringing in money. And it's not. It's about public safety. And unfortunately, we need a stick and not a carrot. And that's what brings in the revenue. But this is not about revenue. It's about public safety. And, and, and uh, I'll, I'll stop there. I thank you for your time. I'll be happy to take uh, questions now. I don't know if you would prefer to hear from the rest of the panel, uh, um, but what, whatever your pleasure is, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, we are gonna continue with the panel, I mean, with the, with the public testimonies. Um, we don't usually do Q&A with, with, um, with the panelists. Yes. Okay, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would love to call up um, Angel Brea. First, I would like to say good afternoon. Um, thank you for having us. Um, thank you for um, giving us the opportunity and this platform to speak about this serious issue. Um, I would like to introduce myself again. My name is Angel Brea. I am a senior parking meter supervisor one. Um, as I stand before you today as a representative of my fellow workers, um, I just want to shed some light on the daily challenges that um, facing city employees with verbal harassment as, as well as physical abuse just for doing their jobs. I began my career uh, with the city of Boston in September 2008 as a parking meter supervisor, uh, which is an entry level position for the enforcement division of the transportation department. Of my 15 years of service, I have only worked in the enforcement division. Um, and in those years, it has not been strange for me to hear our constituents shout obscenities um, and, wish up, and wish harm upon us. It has become the regular occurrence that we must brush off like nothing happened. Uh, but in the past few years, it has, be, it has been getting uh, way worse. City employees are being attacked for fulfilling their duties. In August um, 2023, a female parking meter supervisor, while doing her duties, was violently shoved by a constituent just for issuing a citation um, on Boylston Street. 
Also in August of 2023, a senior parking meter supervisor one um, was assaulted and had his finger broken for issuing a citation for being double parked, which if anybody would like to see, I actually have a picture of his fracture. A male uh, parking meter supervisor was punched in the face while learning how to perform uh, the duties of the job with less than two months um, here. And this was in October. On December 1st, a female parking meter supervisor with less than three months of service while perform performing her duties um, was assaulted on Washington Street and chased with a bat. And it, it, these are things that are not just affecting us, but also other departments. A tow truck supervisor um, that same month in December was also assaulted and punched in the face. Um, that same month, a, another supervisor was pulled from his vehicle um, after issuing a citation. Shortly after that, a, another supervisor had a uh, mustard bottle thrown at her just for issuing a citation. Worker safety should be prioritized for city employees because this, is the, this has direct impact on the delivery of public services. Uh, when city employees are safe and secure, they can perform their duties effectively without fear or distraction. When city employees are assaulted or targeted, it, is, it not only affects their well-being, but also hinders their ability to serve the community effectively. I ask uh, for the help not only of you, the city councilors, but also um, high public officials to reach out to prosecutors in these cases, in future cases, to hold these perpetrators um, perpetrators accountable for their actions. Apologies do not seem apologies do not seem appropriate after such horrendous acts, which seems to be the solution in most of these um, actions. Um, I suggest that a committee be created to discuss how to respond to these cases of attacks on public uh, employees and prevent them from happening in the future. Um, another uh, proposal that I have would be to um, come up with a way of including uh, within our handhelds a better way of us reporting um, these uh, attacks on our officers. Um, sometimes I understand that the biggest complaint I get is that, um, you know, filling out the form, sometimes it's, it's burdensome on them um, and sometimes difficult. Um, so if there's a way that we can include that into our equipment so that, you know, they can just, when it happens, they can um, submit those requests right there. Um, uh, an, an upgrade on handhelds would be beneficial as the system that we have in place now um, currently either stop working in the middle of the ticket or they have an issue where um, the handhelds are not connecting with the printer, which creates a lot of um, the issues with the constituents because, you know, if, if you come out to somebody giving you a ticket and it hasn't printed yet, their first response is, there's no ticket. Well, they don't understand that once we pass that first screen, we have to complete those tickets. We can't just void it or make it disappear. Um, The, um, the radios that we currently have. Um, our current radios have an um, emergency button that we can press to signal that you know, something is happening. The only problem that we have currently with that system is that it notifies the office that a problem is happening, but it doesn't give us, give them, provide them with a location. It doesn't provide them, um, it, it basically puts it back on us to be able to respond. So like if I were to press, my emergency button now, the only thing I will get is somebody from the other line saying, are you having a problem? And in the case that we can respond, it's helpful because we're able to provide all that information, but in the sense that you know somebody is disabled and can't um, speak, there's really nothing that um, can be provided to um, get assistance to those um, in need. Thank you. Thank you. 
At this time, I'd like to come, call up Chris Tiger Stockbridge. Sorry, getting old, I need glasses. <laughs> for those that don't know me, my name's Chris Stockbridge. I've uh, worked for the city of Boston since 1989. I've been with the code enforcement since 1992. Um, I just recently became president of ASME Council 93, so now I represent all Boston city workers that are under ASME's reign. I also am president of ASME Local 1631, which has animal control, code enforcement, assessing, and now Boston 311. I wanted to clear a couple issues up for the testimony that was stated before us is our orange buttons go nowhere. You could push that orange button until you're green in the face and nothing's gonna happen except it's gonna beep loud and aggravate a lot of people around you. That's a problem. But we do have a system of code enforcement where we will call out what is called a code green, which signifies to other officers that you're in trouble. As a supervisor, our staffing levels are very tough right now. We have five offices Monday to Friday from 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. Five, five for the entire city of Boston, okay? So for you that think I can get from one spot to the other to save somebody probably getting his yelled at or whatever, it, it's a very unrealistic. We rely heavily on the Boston Police Department to help us out, as well as other brother and sister agencies of, of other city workers that are out there. Um, I've just sent Commissioner, I mean Chief Hodge, an email that I'd like to have a meeting with him as soon as possible, along with the members of this panel, along with Eddie Nastari and our group, so that we can sit down and start to clear up some of the stuff that was spoken before us, because we don't always think that the true picture is painted, and for you councils that have come in so far to ask me, you know that we're not gonna let you come in there and just hear a bunch of fluff and BS. You're gonna hear the truth of what's going on within our workplaces at the city. That's very important. To say that we're de-escalating the issues out there, we do. You, you, it's a tough job. If you don't violate, we don't have a reason to meet you. If there isn't a problem in your property, we have no reason to stop and bother with you. If your car's not parked across a, a handicap, you're not gonna meet us. We meet the violators, we meet the people that are the problem. But as Jim Durkin spoke, it shouldn't be about the money. It's supposed to be education through enforcement. Tom Menino taught us that. Education through enforcement. We're giving tickets hoping that you'll correct those problems and won't do it again. It's not to get out there and, and blow your pockets up and, and hurt you being a homeowner or anything else, but without these fines, you're not gonna get the, the compliance purpose. We haven't had a labor management meeting since 2013. 2013, and the only reason we've gotten any meeting since is Dennis Roach took over in code enforcement and sat us down and had, had some talks to see what we could do better. 2013, so for anybody to tell you that we've had anything since, I have Brother Nastari that's gonna come up after me. Again, BS, it doesn't happen. Um, sorry if I seem a little irritated, but when you're getting phone calls on a daily basis of everything going wrong, I ask for this position, I welcome those phone calls, but I tell you now, I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that those calls are heard those members are fixed and those members are happy. Nobody wants to come to a job and come to a job that you're not happy doing. That goes from the way the public's gonna treat us as well as the people that we're working for are gonna treat us. And I hold them all to the same standard. So ASPE Council 93 represents public safety across Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Specifically in the city of Boston, we have parking enforcement, code enforcement, the park ranges, animal control, and we do have other forms of enforcement such as health inspectors and uh, rodent inspectors and others that are gonna write violations against property, maybe not so much as uniformed. We're here today to stand up and fight for our rights to a work in a safe place and a safe environment. We now live in a society that disrespects all types of law enforcement and its agencies created to make sure that everybody follows the rules. This is nothing new. I've worked for the city since 1989 and I've seen assaults on my sisters and brothers on many occasions. But what I'm seeing now is disgusting. People are no longer afraid to put their hands on other people and fear no consequences. They throw coffee at us, they swear at us, they threaten us and more. I've had this happen to myself. Some of you counselors witnessed an event of, I had to issue a store a ticket in Hyde Park 
and I was told that I was illegally parking while I was issuing the ticket and doing my job. I was harassed, and then after, that's only what you saw on camera. Off camera was much worse. But what did I do? I said, thank you, I smiled, and I walked away. The attack on our parking enforcement supervisor is both disgusting and disgraceful. The person's a gentle, kind-hearted person who likes everyone and respects everyone. Always smiling. They're extremely friendly and very approachable. Yet at 1.15 a.m. in the morning in Dorchester, a scumbag decided to beat him with his own radio for doing his job. Ripped the radio off his chest. Beat him. That's not okay. Never going to be okay. Just because he was making sure a crosswalk was clear so kids and other people could walk to safety the next day and run their daily errands. For doing his job, this worker suffered injuries beyond what any person should ever have to worry about doing their job. I do want to thank Mayor Wu, because when the gentleman finally came to, came to light, she was his first call. That's, that, that holds a lot of weight with the union. The mayor of Boston reached right out, making sure you're okay. Whatever we have, whatever you need, I give you his credit for that. We got you. That hasn't happened in a long time. I want to thank the Boston police for catching this scumbag right away and locking him up. But only to hear that he was going to be released on a $500 bail, it's a joke. Should never happen. Not after what he did. Certainly $500, it costs the city a lot more than that, and it's going to cost the city a lot more than that. Never mind the mental damage it's going to do to this member. I have to thank many of our brothers and sisters throughout all these unions that stand with us to try and make sure this doesn't happen again. But sadly, we, we know it will. And why? Because as a society, we're teaching our kids to disrespect people. We're teaching that it's okay to stand up and fight the power all the time. And not to, not to respect law enforcement and the people who are actually enforcing these laws. And although the police have the ability to arrest those people and do that, we don't anymore. Correct, Councilor, they, they took away 400 from us. They, they didn't think all these things through when they took these laws away from us. I'm asking all of our legislators, both on the state level, city level, and federal level, to protect us. Hold these people accountable. Don't cut deals and let them go. Show us that you have our backs. Show us that you will stand with us and you will protect us. Hold these law breakers accountable right to the extent of the law. $5,000 fine. Let's see them do 90 days in jail. I think it'll make them think twice again before they beat the shit out of a poor, innocent guy doing his job on Georgia Street. Ridiculous. Let's not wait for it to happen again now. We have a mayor who stands with us. We have a council that's standing with us. We have a district attorney that said they're standing with us. We even have a governor right now in there that's going to stand with us. So the time is now. Pass these laws. Write an ordinance. Do a lot more than what we're doing now to protect our workforce. It's going to go a long way. I'd rather stand here and testify today than have to stand at one of my members' families and say, I'm sorry for your loss. We should have did better. Today's that day. Let's do better. Thank you. Thank you. This time I would like to call up the next panel, the, the next speaker. Testify. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Eddie Nastari. I'm the Director of Field Services and Organizing at AFSCME Council 93. As, as I stand here today, I didn't prepare a statement. I, I'm, I'm doing this strictly off the cuff. As I stand here today and I've heard the testimony and from the panel and the questions that were asked, I have a few questions myself. And actually maybe more some asks. Maybe even a challenge or two. Council Pepin, you asked a question about what are we doing for this gentleman? Um, when I got the call after this happened, um, I immediately reached out to the administration. They Im immediately reached right back to me. Hey, what can we do to help? And this is going to tie into another thing when I end, but I want to, I want to let you know this. The one thing the administration told me was, whatever he needs, he's going to get. Whatever we can do to help you is going to happen. One of the first things that went off in my head was, this gentleman is going to be out for a while. 
we have a provision in our contract, Article 17. I want to make sure I have it right. Section 19, the collective bargaining agreement that gives our members 90 days of active violence pay to cover the difference of workman's comp at 100%. The administration right away was, we're going to work with you. If it goes past 90 days, we're going to help you. We're going to figure it out. We will do it together. So kudos to the administration. Great job. They've already assured us of that and the member. But it's not always been like that, and I will tie into the late, that later on at the end. Um, I heard from the chief about open door policy and open, open email box. Well, I've emailed the chief a few times and got no responses. I'm going to challenge the chief right now with me here. Have a labor management meeting with us, not only with code enforcement, but with BTD. And I'll be in attendance. And I would request that you ask if he would be in attendance. I would also challenge the chief through you, Jim, to come to Frontage Road, both at BTD and code enforcement, with me to hear the concerns of the members, his employees. I would ask if you can make that challenge now. We can get some assurances right now that that's going to happen. It's not an unreasonable ask due to the circumstances. Can I ask a question? No, I'm not, I'm not, when I'm, okay. Um, thank you for the question and thank you for the for the ask um, the way that this works is I'm gonna the chief has to speak directly to me and then I respond on his behalf to you that'd be great um, how long before we get that answer um, shouldn't take that long but how long right no for sure I will speak to the chief right after this this hearing and have him give you the, the response okay we appreciate that yes sir Over the years, would you like to pause for a minute? Give me a we'll we'll pause, sure. for a clarifying question from Councillor Murphy. Oh, so, and then I have a lot of questions. Um, Just one. And I'm, I know, I will stick to one. And I'm sorry that your um, public testimony, the intent was so, um, that you were a panel so it could be back and forth. But I don't want to make any assumption, but your ask seems reasonable and is the reason why you would want to be there is so that the employees would feel safe, that they could share their concerns. There's no, no other reason why. Yep, okay, just making sure that you're making it clear that you want to be there so that the employees have, feel like they have union support when sharing any of their concerns to their superiors. 100%, and I, okay. I, I want to add to that, if you don't mind. This is a problem we can only fix together. It says it in our contract that the city and the union will work together to create a harmonious working relationship. We need to fix it together. We need to help you as much as you need to help us. We will stand with you. We will talk with our members, your employees, with you. The only way it's gonna get fixed is if we do it together. I just wanna stress that. Again, this administration's been good to us. We, wanted, we want that to continue. We wanna fix this together. I'll leave you with this. Actually, there's one other point I'd like to make. If counselors are doing ride-alongs, 
I'd ask that you do it with the employees. Get their perspective on things, not the supervisors. Do it with the employees. Get their perspective on things. Then if you want to do an additional ride along with the, with the supervisors, do that as well. But do it with the employees. Meet with the employees. It's important. Over the years, in my role, I was also a city employee, just to let you know. I worked for the Boston Parks Department years ago. Over the years, we've had to have some struggles with the act of violence pay, getting it paid out. One thing stuck out to me and that really struck home. We filed a grievance for a young woman who got workman's comp, yet was denied active violence pay. And in the decision, I'm going to take a blurb of each. The department argued that it did not violate the collective bargaining agreement, and this grievance should be denied. Because the grievant failed to show she was entitled to active violence pay. The department, this is very key here, the department does not dispute that the incident occurred. However, they believe the grievant is not entitled to the act of violence pay. Our response was simple. The grievant is a parking enforcement officer. And on March 19, 2021, someone threw a bottle at her while she was issuing a ticket. Threw a bottle at her. Here's what makes it worse. She was 11 weeks pregnant and they denied the act of violence pay. I worked with this administration to solve this problem, and we got it resolved, but it shouldn't have to take us to file a grievance and go to arbitration to do so. I ask that you work with us and help us fix these problems together and make this the first class city that it is. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I see that we have one more person, Joanne Wallace. She left. She left? She okay. Left. We can speak on her behalf. She actually explained to us what happened. You wanted us to. Uh, can they submit a written testimony? Please. Thank you for that. Um, and at this time, that that closes the public testimony. And before, before we end, I do want to just read into the record a letter from Councillor Weber. Um, he says, Dear Chair, please excuse my absence from today's Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology hearing on docket number 0332, order for a hearing to discuss the safety of our city workers. The safety of our city employees is an issue that I care deeply about. We should be doing all we can do to make sure those working for the city on the job are treated with respect and dignity they deserve. I ask if you can to please read this letter and the following questions into the record in my absence. What is the protocol for BTD workers when they are under threat? Do those procedures need to be revised? What sort of training do BTD workers receive around physical threats? How often are BTD workers threatened or assaulted while performing their duties? And what are current staffing numbers for meter aids? And is this up or down from previous years? Please note that my staff will be attending the hearing and I'll thoroughly review the video, hearing minutes and public testimony for this document. Docket. Sincerely, Boston City Councilor Benjamin Weber for District 6. So what I'll do is I'll make sure that um, both the the panel and the public testifiers get the questions in case anyone wants to answer those questions for Councillor Weber. Um, but at this time, I do want to I, I do want to um, do closing statements. Um, Councillor Murphy, would you like to provide a closing statement? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you to the union for coming. Also, I know this is just the beginning of the conversation and a change in the way we do business with you 
And I do just want to say when you mentioned the ride along, um, I've, I have set up many and tried and do get pushback from the administration and then told, or if it's even school visits. So sometimes not all of us are allowed to just pick who we go on a ride along, because I agree, to get the best out of it, you need to be riding along with you know any shift at any time during you know in any neighborhood but we don't always get the privilege of choosing i was told even though the supervisor was very nice but i had to do a, you know with the supervisor so just so you're clear um some of us are told that but i agree that that's important i do just want to close saying you know attacks on city workers don't only jeopardize their physical well-being but undermine our community. It's been said many times, but it's true. Um, when our city workers are targeted and harmed, it sends a message that violence and disrespect are tolerated. Unfortunately, we are in a time where many of you stated it already that what you're seeing today is not what you saw five, even five, ten years ago when you were out on the street. So we have to make sure that the public are educated but that they buy in and many times we talk about when we have meetings with Dennis and others about code enforcement John like the cost of doing business when we're talking about you know people putting their trash out too early or being bad landlords that there's not a fine large enough for them to even think it matters but for our workers they need to know that we'll be trying to figure out whatever it takes to make sure that you're, you feel respected. I respect all of you, and I hope you know that I'm here to support you in any way going forward. So thank you for being here, and know that, like I said, it's just the beginning of making sure we get this better, because you deserve it, and the city can do better. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor Murphy. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the administration team that is here. Thank you to the public testimony from our dedicated and professional city employees that are here. I, I would like to continue the conversation. I know you, you asked some serious, significant questions, and, and I think you are entitled to answers. And, and I'd like to continue talking to you, whether it's formally like this or it's it's informally, but I think the questions you had asked are important questions that we should just not ignore. You highlighted a, a couple of issues that were concerning to me, and I'm not blaming anybody. And this goes back since 2013, so it's no one's responsibility that, are, that is sitting here. But now, now is the time for a labor and management meeting. And if that meeting happens down Frontage Road, that's where it should be. And I, I would recommend having that in the next 60 days. I think it's important. I think the administration would support that. That's a reasonable request that you made. I also would like to ask the administration, but also, but also the public testimony from members of Local 93, and I wish I had the opportunity to ask you this directly, but are you keeping a log, are you keeping a record of all assaults that have taken place by the public against personnel, city employees? And if so, I'd like to get a copy of it through the, through the chair. And I'd like to ask the same question to, to the administration. I would like to see, the, see a copy of all assaults against city employees maybe over the last five years, over the last six years, so I can get a better understanding of, of this situation. I have other comments I want to make, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna withhold making them right now other than to say, because someone, because someone in the public is frustrated that they're getting a ticket, don't take that out on our city employees. Our city employees, transportation, code enforcement, police. I was with the chair over the weekend. We went to see Manlio, an all-black division in the Boston Police Department. But our city employees provide tremendous service to the residents of the city and visitors as well. 
and they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And at times, they're not treated with that level of respect. And it's concerning to me, and I know it's concerning to everyone in this room as well. But the public awareness campaign has to start. It has to be part of the upcoming city budget. It needs to be included. We need to educate the public in, in English and other languages, too, about how important it is to treat city workers. As I mentioned at my opening statement, and I, and I listen closely to you, Jim, and you are right, this isn't about traffic enforcement professionals getting money for the city. This is about public safety, making sure our streets and, and, and sidewalks are safe. And in Tiger, this is about making sure that our restaurants are healthy and the, the garbage is picked up and the snow is removed. That's, that's public safety. You don't want to give a ticket. What you want to do is you want to provide a safe environment, a health and healthy environment for everyone. So I'm going to stop there other than to say let's, let's make sure that a public awareness campaign is part of this budget and let's ensure that when, when contracts are discussed and negotiated, the safety of our workers are, are a critical part of that discussion. Let's pay our workers with, let's pay our workers a, a, a living wage and ensure that they're able to live in the city of Boston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, commend you on your grace in handling this uh, hearing. Um, I, as I'm hearing the testimonies um, first from Chris, um, there, so, I, I'm sorry, it was uh, Angel, the first gentleman, who mentioned um, emergency um, uh, or a, a button that does not track location but just notifies the office or the supervisor. And um, I think that's, that's super concerning, worth talking about. Um, there were conversations, and I know a contract in a way to, for um, uh, flag, um, I guess, uh, workers or traffic workers but then if they don't have a camera on them as well, that's another concern. Because if you're, if you're doing any level of enforcement, it has to be accountability. How do you do that without a camera? Or how to do, do that without GPS tracking system? Um, so I think that's worth um, talking about. Um, as well as, you know, I heard you, Tiger, talk about, you know, education through enforcement. And I really like that, that, you know, you correct people and you expect them to do the right thing. Um, and I support um, the uh, Councilor Flynn in terms of, you know, holding the meeting um, for the labor management meeting uh, within the next, um, I don't know if it's, and I, and I don't want to put a date out there. I want to say on record that I support that um, and speak with the um, administration to understand what are the possibilities. Is it the next 30 or 60 or 90 days. Um, I'm not sure, so I don't want to go on record on a time frame because I don't know, I don't have the back information, background information on that. Um, and then, you know, I, I heard, hear you loud and clear on saying that we stand with you is just not enough. Um, it's kind, but it's just not enough. So um, I want to take you up on the visit to um, your, your location. Um, I, I speak just simply because I've been doing uh, work on supporting um, labor and unions since I was a teenager, um, and I just believe in it. I'm an immigrant, and I believe in it. So um, even if we don't have a relationship, um, I believe in doing the right thing. So hopefully we can get to know each other and understand the work that you're doing so that we can support you better. So in the ride along, I've never been on one and looking forward to do that. Um, the story about the pregnant employee just really broke my heart um, that they, she was denied an after assault um, any type of payment um, and, or benefits. That's, that's um, disheartening and uh, again looking to do my research and understand what happened there. Um, as far as the structure here and we always talk about um, you know how to be most efficient with the, the structure of a hearing and um, I, I keep saying, you know, make it as, as, as casual as possible, as simple as possible with uh, Robert's rules. And I think Robert's rules is pretty simple. But the fact that we didn't have our public testimony um, uh, folks on the panel 
And the fact that, um, you know, the back and forth or the questions that need to happen, had I heard this first, I would have had a different set of questions for the administration. And so I think, um, you know, looking into uh, future conversations means that we are bringing um, um, these folks onto the panel. Um, I don't know if it's a working session, I don't know if it's a meeting, I don't know how we do that, but. Um, that they are included in the conversation and then also in preparation, um, and I know this is not on you, Mr. Chair, um, but in preparation to those, um, understanding what questions would you like for us to have beyond your testimonies today, and that's helpful for us to be able to um, ask and understand more background information to have a real practical conversation. Um, so I thank you uh, for your, again, your grace, um, Mr. Chair, I see you there patiently. Uh, trying to be as accommodating as possible. Um, as well as to the administration, I stand by what I said, um, that you work hard and I respect what you do, um, but that this level of respect, right? If you respect me, you pay me. If you respect me, you protect me, all right, and vi vice versa. Um, I think it's a matter of a conversation, getting the meeting that Councilor Flynn is talking about, you know, us supporting you and making sure that advocating, making sure that that meeting happens. Um, and, and figuring it out. If uh, our mayor is supportive and she's been good to you, great. Uh, let's put more action to that and um, let's back you up as much as possible. Um, and I 100% agree that um, the enforcement or through courts or whatever, if, if the state, if the governor, the mayor, and the DA is all saying, look, this is atrocious and more needs to happen to maybe incentivize people to not feel like they can just attack someone on the job. Um, I'm, I'm behind that too. It's, it's not okay. You don't just get to go home and, oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I guess I won't do it again. Really? Um, it's just not okay. So thank you for your heartening um, testimonies today. I look forward to getting to know you and working with you. Um, and Mr. Chair, thank you for allowing me this time. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councilor Fitzgerald. Yes, uh, very briefly. I think one positive aspect we can take from all this is that the administration doesn't want to see this happen again, labor doesn't want to see this happen again, and the city council doesn't want to see this happen again, this specific incident or anything like it and some of the ones we've heard. Uh, so I know that together we can have a positive impact going forward to, to resolve this issue, and I know we'll all work together to help make that happen. Um, uh, Tiger, you mentioned education through enforcement, and I, I just really like that line, so I want to highlight that. Um, it's something that can apply to a lot of other levels, uh, right? a lot of other departments as well. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it just stands for accountability. Um, and whether we have to teach people, hey, we're going to hold you accountable, um, and how we can do that. I think a campaign is a good way. I would still like to look for something more concrete, um, whether that is uh, being a protected employee and there's uh, greater fines for things that happen towards this specific group of people or something like that I think that's something we can explore uh, and I'd like to help you guys do that um, but again at the end of this I know that there is a solution here because everyone wants the same result so look forward to being a part of that and chair thank you very much for your time thank you counselor counselor Durkin thank you so much chair I'll yield back my time I just appreciate all of the time spent today appreciate all of the context um, so thank you Thank you. Um, I'll give my final closing remarks. I just want to thank both the, the administration and you, ask me, um, the workers, for being here today. I cannot reiterate how much I really appreciate the work that everyone in this room does. Ever since I was an intern back in 2016 for a former counselor, I've been working with BTD and code enforcement to get the job done in the city. And it's always you guys that show up. Um, so thank you for that, and I, want, I just want to say that I want to see your departments fully staffed. I want to see you all paid well. I want to make sure that if there is for those um, for those job fairs that you're ho having for these departments, please invite the counselors. Allow help. Allow us to help you expand the word on that because I want to make sure that the, that the residents are going to those job fairs. Um, and I just want to again. Thank you to my council colleagues for, for giving me grace on my first council hearing. Um, this is a very important topic. I'm very lucky that this is the first topic. Not an unfortunate event that for this has happened, but a very important conversation. 
Um, so again, thank you all so much for being here. I look forward to the continued conversations moving forward. With that, I will close out this hearing.